So World War II, the Ulithi Atoll in particular was a very important staging area during World War II. And um, uh, they, there were uh, 722 ships in Ulithi, uh, more than 8,000 men, a few women at the time, and um, floating dry docks capable of hoisting a 45,000 ton warship. This was a serious operation in Ulithi Atoll, out of which were staged some of the great battles such as Iwo Jima. Um, so here, Falalup, the island of Falalup was leveled in the 40s to build an airstrip, and everything, this is uh, in the process of, of uh, clearing it, but every single tree was gone. They leveled it entirely. Okay, finished. Here is uh, one of the landing craft, and you can see the runoff here and the breakage in the reefs from these landing craft. It was an unbelievable impact, an ecological impact, whose footprint still exists today. Um, this is my favorite picture. It's a little X-rated here, but you know. So, um, so they used uh, the spiritual island of Mog Mog as their R and R. But actually, something really amazing, once again, these people have a lot of foresight. The chiefs, because the U.S. went in there and said, we're going to move you all out of here. We're going to take you off your islands, and we're going to move you onto the main island of Yap. And, and that's just what we're going to do, because we need your islands. And the chief negotiated with the general. And he said, you know what? Let us stay. If we leave, we will not come back. If we leave, it will destroy our cultures and our traditions and our communities. Take us all to one island. You choose it. We don't care. Take us all to one. You can shove us all on that one island. Feel free to use our atoll, and then let us go home when it's all over. And they negotiated that successfully, and that's what they did. And I'm sure that it saved the communities of Ulithi. So a lot of uh, military trash on the ground, too, because you know after the war, it was much easier just to sink everything than, than to try to ship it home. Um, here is a Mog Mog, and so you can see how it was leveled to put the Quonset huts up there. This was the party island. And here's the landing at Mog Mog. You can see what it used to be like during the war and what it is like today. So these had tremendous ecological impacts on these communities. So when we went out there, the first thing we did was talk to people. What, what's, what's happening? Why is it different? You, you invited me out here to talk about management. You said your fish are disappearing. Why? What's going on? And their first response to me was, well, aren't you going to like give us a plan? And I said, well, why would I give you a plan? I have no clue about your reefs. You've been living here for years. You know your reefs. I'm not going to give you a plan, and I'm not going to play conservation god with you. But the knowledge for how to manage your system lies within your communities. You know how to do this. You may have forgotten some of it, and things may have changed more quickly than you understand. So I can help you understand some ecological changes. I can survey the reef. I can give you some information. But you have to come up with your plans, because they're already here. You just maybe need to revive some of them. So we talked with as many people as we could. This was a, a gentleman here, an elder. He was the oldest in his. He couldn't remember how old he was. This, uh, this gentleman, but he had some incredible stories and was able to tell us a lot about what traditional management they used to use that was not being used anymore. One of the things, and this was fascinating to, to me, was that they used to only be allowed to take four large grouper, the biggest of the grouper, only four. If you took more than four, evil would befall your family. And that's a pretty powerful, like, instead of not to, right? So why four? What's that about? Well, turns out that many grouper are sex changers, and the largest of them are females, and the largest of them are the gravid females. So this is protecting the reproductive, basically, capacity of the population of grouper in that. Uh, so he would tell us these things, and then we'd say, you know, are people still doing that? He'd say, I don't know. I don't think so. so but these were important, because we could then convey that to the, to the people in our meetings and say, you guys, you used to do this kind of management, and it, apparently it worked. And so you're not seeing as many grouper now? Well, maybe there's a reason for that. And we interviewed um, women. We interviewed every demographic we could imagine to try to get as much information as possible, the fishermen. Um, so here's the story of the spear guns. This is a, a common problem throughout Micronesian waters. Spear guns have changed. They used to be poles, basically. Okay, So imagine a spear pole, right? which isn't really easy to catch a fish. You take a pole and you have to stab the fish with it. It's not easy to do, and only certain fish can you fish this way. Now they have spring-loaded guns, and from Hawaii they have trigger-loaded guns. So this is a real gun, much easier to catch a fish with it. And on top of that, they have lights, so they can go at night. And a lot of fish sleep at night. And one of the fish that sleeps at night is this one, 
which is our friend again, the parrotfish. Parrotfish actually build little cocoons for themselves and snooze through the night, so you can, you can catch them super easily at night. And parrotfish are sex changers too. And remember, they're algae eaters. So they're super important to controlling algae on reefs, which is then helping to keep the reef ecology healthy. You go and blast away a bunch of large, colorful parrotfish at night, you're going to be getting all the males. Because they're sex changers, they start life as a female, they turn male later in their lives. And, and one large male can mate with many females. And what happens is that when you remove the large males, which in part are controlling sex changing through pheromones in the water, you remove that large male and his previous girlfriend will now become the male. And then her friends will become her, his mates, whatever, right? So, but it's smaller now, so it's a smaller male. And you repeat that many times across the reef, you're going to get a whole bunch of small males, which can't mate with as many females. And the reproductive capacity will go down, as will the role of those fish in keeping the reef healthy. That story made perfect sense to the people. They didn't know it. They didn't know that fact, that piece of scientific information. They didn't know that. But when told that story, it made perfect sense to them. Do they see a decline in parrotfish? Definitely, they know that. Do they know it's because of the spear guns? They have a pretty good, strong idea, yes. Did they understand exactly why? No. So by providing them with that information, it inspired them and armed them to be able to talk to their community about why they needed to make that change. And they have throughout these islands now. In fact, we left Woliai Atoll, we went out to Satawal, and by the time we came back, which was four days later, they had already banned a bunch of spearfishing at night and implemented a whole bunch of new plans in a matter of days. And I didn't write anything for them. I just talked to them about what some of the impacts of these more modern technologies were having. This might not look modern to you, this, this particular, but it's for them and for their systems it's quite modern, the spring-loaded gun. Okay, so I'm just going to show you really quickly here because, um, I don't know, this is like my scientist side saying I've got to show you that we actually collected data too, right? So. I'm not going to bore you with our data, but I'm going to stop at a few important pieces that are helping us tell the story of what's happening out there. So we did survey the reefs. We did collect uh, some genetic data. We collect some samples on which Giacomo did genetic, genetic data. We've also worked with the community uh, to help them understand how to measure the fish and sex the fish themselves. So they're taking data on what percentage of the fish they're catching are females, which ones are males, which ones are, have eggs in them, and how big they are, like this. So they can inform themselves about what's happening with the fish they're catching, right? And then they can send me those data, and we can look at those data, and we can say, oh, look, 70% of your catch are babies. Probably not a good plan there, right? So maybe you need to think about the type of gear you're using, the nets, I don't know, but you're catching a lot of babies. And you might want to take a look at that. So they can use that information then to adjust their management. OK, so here's one thing we found, which is fascinating. We found an overgrowth of this kind of coral, which Giacomo analyzed. And it turns out it's an unidentified species. And I was so excited to go out to the outer islands because I knew that we had this great system here of an invasive coral that was moving its way across the outer islands from Ulithi Atoll, because everybody had told me they saw this coral in the outer islands. So, I mean, it's not great to be excited about something that may not be great, but, you know, scientifically it was really interesting, right? So out to the outer islands I went and nobody had this. Nobody else had this. This seems to be specific to Ulithi. And Ulithi is the one place that had all the ships that came in during World War II. So I don't know, I can't say there's a connection there, but there's something unique about Ulithi Atoll. And this Montipara is flourishing right where all those landing craft landed. So right where the reefs were sort of barged through and there was a lot of activity and things coming in and out, that's where this Montipara seems to be flourishing. It's kind of it's fascinating. And then we also found this which is a coralomorph, which is kind of a poisonous critter. And the chiefs told us that they think this is poisoning them. And when they first told us about this, we thought, well, really? Like, like a squishy thing on the reef? I don't know about that. So we went and looked. Of course, they were right, <laughs> because these coralomorphs are toxic. And these are the same coralomorphs that are invading Palmyra Atoll, which is a large marine protected area. And in fact, um, you can so, it's becoming so large on Palmyra, you can see it from space. So the U.S. government just funded a big project to remove a ship <laughs> that had grounded on the reef there 
And the iron from the ship, it turns out, is probably promoting the growth of this organism, which is an invasive one, and it's killing the reef. And you know what? So we were kind of interested, like, what's causing the coralomorphs to grow on Mog Mog? Right? So any metal out here? No, not that they could find. Well, I dug around with Mike Mayer, um, who's a historian in the region, and we found this kind of cool fact. Here's the coralomorph bed right here off Mog Mog. When the US military arrived in Ulithi Atoll, they didn't yet know if the Japanese were gone. So they were prepared to shell if they needed to. And they arrived at Mog Mog, and they thought they saw some Japanese on the island. And so they blasted the reef with shells. It's the only place, the only place they detonated their shells. And it's where the coralomorph bed is. I don't know if there's a connection there or not, but it's kind of interesting. So. OK, and then um, these are just some pictures of the reefs to show you that there's very different kinds. There's a, a, a coral-dominated reefs. There's these flatter reefs that are dominated by turf. So the reefs do cluster in these really nice clusters by type, okay, by sort of benthic habitat types of reefs. So we're able to show the people that you have different types of reefs. And those different types of reefs are under different kinds of pressure. And they have different kinds of fish that feed off of them. So an understanding on their part of the ecology of the reefs that they have helped them understand which kinds of fishing might be more appropriate on which kinds of reefs. And this just shows you these red bars here are that invasive coral. And so all you need to do is look on the left side of this graph. And this is where all the villages are, <laughs> all those landing sites. On the right side of the graph are sort of much what we would consider healthier reefs, more diverse corals in a way. And these are all the places that are farther away from those areas where the landing craft were. So interesting pattern, you know. They, they were really excited about this pattern because they, they've always been blamed for causing all the problems themselves, you know. So they were happy to know that maybe someone else had a hand in this. Um, and here's fish biomass to show you that fish biomass also, this is the number, the amount of fish, the weight basically of all the fish, varies. And it's very low on the inhabited islands and much higher on the uninhabited islands. So here was the message with that. They've stopped using canoes in some of these islands as much as they used to and started using motorboats, which was great during the time when they got war claims money in the late 70s because they had cash and they bought fuel and they fished whatever. But then that money dried up. Fuel is extremely expensive and difficult to get. They have fewer canoes now because they gave them up for the motorboats. So they're using their motorboats to fish the same areas over and over, close to shore, because they can't afford fuel to go farther away anymore. And that's the effect. Overfishing at home and plenty of fish elsewhere. So part of our message to them was to understand what the advent of motorboats is doing to their fishing and how they can try to incorporate um, different kinds of, of fishing and farther away. And by the way, one of the things we're really interested in introducing out here is a plastic to fuel converter, which is a machine that takes plastics and they've got it all over their beaches. And it converts plastic into fuel. And the number one use of fuel out there is fishing. And so if they can convert all that garbage and turn it into fuel and use that fuel to fish farther reefs, it will go a long way to help them diversify their impact on the reefs. So that's one of the things that we're kind of excited about doing out there. Okay, I'm not going to show you more of these data because there's a lot of data. Most of the garbage is washed up. And you can see it. It's all from Philippines and it comes from all over the place. Yeah, it's all over the beaches. I had a bunch of pictures in here to show you and then I decided to take them out because they're kind of depressing. Um, so this is just an example here. I'm going to close it up. But this is an example of what we do with um, the fish data. So this just shows them that the majority of the fish they catch is this one kind of fish. And then we're able to show them how big they are, whether or not they're juveniles or adults. So we just provide them these data, and it helps them understand the impacts of their fishing. And this is one of the management plans that was put in place. You can't read that. You don't need to, and please don't. But my point is that these islands are starting right now to put management plans in place very, very quickly. We've got the three islands of four in Ulithi already managing things for themselves, not because of a plan we told them to do for themselves. They all say it's working, so they're very excited. We haven't looked at the data yet, but they believe so, which to me is 90% of it anyway, because they believe it's helping. Um, this is a picture of some erosion, so we're not going to get into that because this is something that they're all facing. And so 
my point here with this work and this talk and, and trying to get the word out about this conservation is that, you know, we are at a time here in history of precipitous declines, not just ecologically, but culturally. We're losing languages, we're losing cultures, we're losing knowledge at an unbelievably fast rate. And with that loss goes a vast loss of knowledge about how to manage ecosystems. So if we can connect with people and bring them science and listen to them about what works and has worked historically, I think we can move forward a lot faster. And as I mentioned before, there's so few examples of that in conservation planning today. So our future plans with this work, we'll be doing a workshop this summer in the Outer Islands. So we're going to bring representatives from all those Outer Islands. They want to come to Ulithi. And we're going to, sh all of them want to share information between each other about what's the problem, what's happening, what are they doing. And it's different island to island. It's fascinating. So they want to talk to each other about what they're doing and, and what's working and what isn't. And then we'll be sharing with them information about how to measure fish and how to keep track of their own fishing. Um, so we'll be doing that this summer. Um, I'm working with an organization also um, called Oceanic Society. And we're putting together a program for volunteers who can come out and help us do that work this summer. So if you're interested, you can, you're certainly welcome to contact me about that. And so here's my kind of my parting thought here. And that is that looking back, meaning looking back into traditional ways and traditional knowledge, doesn't ignore the future, right? It's not about let's just go back as it was better back then. It doesn't ignore the future. And looking ahead only, doesn't mean we have to leave past knowledge behind. It doesn't have to be done in this modern, fast-paced way that's all numbers-based, and we leave everything else behind because that's the old stuff. It doesn't have to be that way. But combining both is a really important way forward. Working together as partners in conservation, I think I know from working out in Micronesia, we can accomplish far more than working alone. We've managed to do unbelievable and unprecedented things out in these outer islands, not because we're so great as a science team, but I really believe it's because the approach we're taking is engaging the communities to do the work and to engage in the work. And it's been really successful out there. OK, I went over. I'm sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.